Hi, everybody. This time we're going to talk about what exactly is magnetism. Now, magnetism is defined as the force exerted by a magnet when it attracts or repels some materials. Magnetism has been known by mankind for thousands and thousands of years. Um, it was first used by sailors, navigators, people who were trying to, ancient peoples who were trying to travel from one part of the world to another part of the world. And aside from navigating using stars and constellations, when they discovered magnetic rocks, it became very helpful. Um, as you know, the earth has an internal magnetic field and they could use these magnets to help navigate. In Old English, there is a word called lodestone, and lodestone means leading stone. It turns out that what was referred to as lodestone is iron ore, and they would take a piece of this iron ore, they could uh, use it, a little sliver of it, balance it on a cork, or insert it in a cork, float it in a little dish of water, and that was one of the very first compasses. In the Asian cultures, they very often would take a piece of lodestone, carve it into the shape of a spoon that would pivot. Um, this is pivoting on a very beautifully carved uh, tablet, and the tablet is marked out with the directions of the compass. So we've known about magnetism for a very long time, but the question is, what actually is it? Well, we do know that magnets produce force fields, just like gravity and electricity. These force fields are fields that emanate out in three dimensions away from something. We can't see force fields with our eyes, but we can encounter the forces that they produce. If you have a simple bar magnet, the force field produced by this bar magnet is going to emanate straight out from both ends of the field. And then the force field from the north to the south end is going to have lovely, nice sweeping arcs from one end to the other. And if you look way out towards the edges of the field, it is going to be coming out of one end, big, massive arc, and going into that other end. This is a two-dimensional image, but actually the force field is in three dimension. It's just very hard to show a three-dimensional force field on a two-dimensional page. Hundreds of, a couple hundred years ago, people started realizing there was a relationship between magnets and electricity. And one of the biggest hints is the fact that they have this attraction and repulsion in common. If you have unlike poles, they attract. Well, this is very much like a positive and a negative electric charge. We know that those will attract. If you have a north and a south pole of a magnet, they will attract. Um, these are iron filings that have been placed between a north and a south pole of the magnet, and the iron filings are actually going to follow the magnetic field lines. And you'll notice that there is a nice strong set of magnetic field lines between the north and the south. And if you go towards these edges, you can begin to see the curling as they are trying to curl between the north and the south fields from there to there. Also, if you have unlike poles, they are going to uh, if you have light poles, they are going to repel. So it doesn't matter if you have two souths or two norths. It's very interesting. This is not a trick of photography. This is actually what the field would look like. If you have two north poles together and you put iron filings here, the little metal filings will come out and then they are literally going to move away. They do not want to go towards the same pole. They're going to follow those field lines and they are going to arc away. This is very similar to electricity. Two light charges are going to repel, and two negative charges are going to repel. Well, in the early 1800s, there was a lot of work on electricity and magnetism that was being done specifically in Europe, some in the Americas. And one of the people that did a lot of work on this was the Danish scientist Hans Christian Orsted. And Orsted was looking for this relationship between electricity and magnetism. And here's what he did. He had a wire, and this wire carried an electric current. So he just had this hooked up to a battery or a power source. Electrons were moving through this battery as a source of electric current. 
what he also did was he had a magnetic compass, the same sort of compass you would use navigating out in the woods. And he brought this compass near this current carrying wire. When he did this, he noticed that when their current flowed, the magnetic needle was deviated. It deviated away from the Earth's magnetic field. When he turned the current off, the needle went back pointing towards magnetic north. He turned the current back on and it changed directions to go around this current carrying wire. So he realized these two things, electricity and magnetism, they are sort of like two sides of the same coin. They are very closely and intimately re related. That a magnetic field is going to be produced whenever you have a current carrying wire or an electric charge like an electron or a proton is in motion. So what makes something magnetic? Well, we're still working on those clues, and these are all pieces to it. The most magnetic elements that we know of are iron, cobalt, and nickel. If you remember your chemistry and periodic table, these three elements are cuddled up very close to each other on that periodic table, and these are the most magnetic common elements. Now, some rare earth elements, these are at the very bottom of the periodic table, um, much less common, neodymium, samarium, more uncommon than iron, cobalt, nickel, will also be magnetic. If you want to stick to a magnet to stick to something, like your, you want a magnetic mount antenna on your vehicle, you want to put a refrigerator magnet on your fridge, it better have one of these materials in it. Um, I remember a dear friend, she collected fridge magnets, got a new refrigerator, and it happened to have an aluminum door. And uh, she put her fridge magnets on there, and she was so heartbroken because her magnets went poof, and they all fell to the floor. Uh, fortunately, there were, the sides were actually magnetic, and they were made out of iron, so she could put them on the side, but she could no longer put them on the front. Another friend bought a new fancy hybrid pickup truck, very lightweight. He had some signs and he couldn't put them on his truck because the new truck, the body panels, a lot of them were mostly aluminum. And so that didn't work. So some materials are very magnetic and others are not. What chemists have found is that all matter has slight magnetic properties, but most are so weak that you and I in our normal life don't even notice them. But they do exist, and scientists who study something, these things have discovered that. So what makes something magnetic? Well, the quick answer and the thing that I want you to put a star by is this, is spinning electrons. This is what they have encountered. Now, if you recall your chemistry, atoms are made up of nuclei that contain protons and neutrons. Around that are electrons that are whirligigging all over the place. Not only are the electrons whirligigging on the outside of those atoms, they are also spinning. And they are spinning like a little top. They are just spinning like these little tops and they're just rotating around. Well, because all matter contains electrons and all electrons are constantly spinning, all matter has slight magnetic properties. What this means also is every single electron in the food you eat, what makes up your bodies, the air you breathe, has is a tiny mini magnet with a north and south pole. Well, if this is true, why isn't everything magnetic? It has to do with how the electrons are aligned. In most elements, electrons tend to pair up. And this, again, goes back to some of the chemistry you may have had in your past. Sometimes, matter of fact, most of the time, most of the electrons inside of matter, you have an electron that's spinning one way, like clockwise, and another electron that's spinning another way, like counterclockwise. And that com combination of two spinning electrons produces a net zero magnetic field. The two actually cancel each other, and this occurs in most elements. But in some special elements, like iron, cobalt, nickel, and I've repeated these a lot, so put a star by those. Those are our most magnetic materials. These tend to not have, uh, not have paired electrons on the outside edge of their energy levels. So these unpaired electrons ha are all over the place acting as tiny itty bitty magnets. 
And these unpaired electrons are spinning, but they're not a magnet yet. And why aren't they a magnet yet? Because they're not pointed in any one particular direction. They're all higgledy-piggledy. So if you pick a piece of iron up, odds are it's not a terribly good magnet. You got to do something to it to make it a magnet, but it's ready to be a magnet because of the configuration of its electrons. So this is how you make it a magnet. You start with a material that has the right electron configuration, which is this unpaired outer electron. And then in order to make it a magnet, you have to put it in a strong magnetic field. So what that means is you put it next to a very, very strong magnet or put it in a strong magnetic field. Then you have to make the atoms within it wiggle. How do you make them wiggle? Well, they start out all higgledy-piggledy pointing in all these different directions and you want them to line up in this magnetic field. How do you do that? Well, one of the ways you can do it is heat. You warm up the piece of material that you want to create a magnet out of. So you add some heat to it, and heat is kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is going to make these guys wiggle. When they wiggle, they're going to go, oh, look, we're in a magnetic field. They're all going to line up north to south, and then when they cool, they're going to cool in the correct alignment. Another way of doing this is time. There is going to be, due to natural background heat, given enough time, this is going to occur naturally. Third way that this can occur is by hitting them. Hitting them will also add some kinetic energy. Um, you can put the piece of metal in this strong magnetic field, hit them with a hammer or, or strike them or drop them really hard, which is not recommended if you have a magnet you want to keep, and what's going to occur is all of the little domains, all these little pieces of magnetic material are going to line up and then this piece of iron has been transformed into a magnet. One of the cool pieces of information about this hitting is in archaeology. If they find an old building that's hundreds of years old that has fallen down is now just a pile of, of boards and rusted out nails, Sometimes archaeologists are trying to put that building back together and they use the nails and the magnetic field. If the nail has a north and a south and this nail over here is oriented south and north because of the fact that these nails, when they were pounded in, they became mini magnets. Archaeologists used the magnetism that was induced in these nails to help reconstruct these ancient buildings. Just really, really cool stuff. One last thing before we leave this, and that is the idea of a magnetic monopole. Mono means one, pole means north or south pole. This is cutting edge science that people are looking for right now. Here's the idea. If you take a bar magnet and you cut it in half, you do not end up with a south pole and a north pole. You don't end up with the north and the south separate. What you end up with is a smaller north-south, north-south. But what if you take this piece and you cut it in half again? What you end up with is a smaller north-south, south-north. What if you take the next one and you cut it in half again? What do you end up with? A smaller south-north, north-south. Scientists for a long time have been saying, is it possible to keep cutting these pieces smaller and smaller and smaller and end up with just a south and just a north, can you separate one from another? And if we could, that would be referred to as a monopole or a single north or south pole. People have been working on it for a long time. As of right now, it has not yet been found. Um, why do we care? Well, we care because some scientists are trying to uncover the basic rules of the universe. And the basic rules of the universe, part of it is called grand unification theory. Some of those predictions say that we should be able to find this. Stay tuned if you care about cutting edge science. Um, someday you might wake up and that might be a headline. All right, have a grand day and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.